I'm really thrilled to be here. I'm particularly delighted to come to a class that um, mixes multiple disciplines, and this is an exciting time in global health. I just returned from a meeting in Johannesburg, an annual PEPFAR meeting for U.S. government staff. And in the closing session of that staff, of that session, a rather emotional one, Ambassador Goosby said that in the PEPFAR program, we've done things that people thought were impossible. And by doing those things, we've shown that we can accomplish other things in global health that are thought impossible. And I hope that that will guide us going forward. Why do we work in global health? I guess a the picture tells the story. It's ultimately to have health impact and to affect the lives of children and adults. But we also work um, for the US government to have an impact diplomatically, economically, politically. And I hope in the discussion period we can return to a discussion of what the motivations are for US government involvement in global health. A word about what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to say a few words about what CDC does in global health, set the context for global health policy, and then talk about the power of evidence and prevention in global health, both in infectious diseases and in non-communicable diseases. And then finally, if we have time, I'll talk about the Global Health Initiative, and then we'll get into our frank discussion on tough policy issues. CDC has been involved in global health for over 50 years. We were involved in smallpox eradication in some of the terrible famines in the 60s and 70s. It's not well known, but CDC has a, a whole section that deals with refugee health. In the 80s and 90s, we really ramped up our involvement in global health with the emergence of HIV AIDS and reemergence of TB and malaria and polio obviously remains a until today. Um, after 2000, 9-11 had a great impact, and I hope we'll come back to talking about that, along with SARS, pandemic flu, the creation of the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, and the President's Malaria Initiative, and who knows what's in the future in global health. What are the components of U.S. government work in global health? At one point, we might have said at CDC that we only work within the green sphere, that of public health, but increasingly our work touches on development, diplomacy, and security, and the interaction of these spheres is what makes work so interesting and challenging nowadays. Both President Obama and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton have spoken about the nexus of these spheres and about the importance of strengthening our diplomatic and development efforts as we work in global health. We work really in three dimensions in CDC in global health. First, and perhaps most importantly, in building global health capacity. Second, in strengthening security, which means in part protecting Americans uh, here and abroad. And third, in global health impact. Where does CDC work? All over the world. Um, this map shows that CDC has a permanent presence in more than 50 countries around the world in a variety of different programs. Um, we also last year sent more than 2,000 people into the field to work in more than 150 countries on temporary assignments. Our overseas workforce is more than 2,000 people. The vast majority of them are locally employed staff. And the relationship between our American staff and our locally employed staff, an interesting subject I hope that we can return to in the discussion period. Um, I'm really intrigued as I put this slide up to receive feedback later from people from the business school about how you manage an organization when your funding is so disproportionately coming from one source. And you can see the red section of the pie is for global AIDS. Um, less than one, we work in dozens of diseases, uh, but in less than 1% of our disease budget, our global health disease budget is in non-communicable diseases, despite the growing and emerging burden in that area, which we'll come back to later. 
Almost everything CDC does in global health, we do in partnership. We have bilateral relationships, obviously, but our multilateral relationships, particularly with WHO, are critically important. Increasingly, we work with other federal agencies. You see noted the Department of State, USAID, Department of Defense, but there are many, many other agencies that we work with as well. We have important relationships with universities and the private sector, and much of our strength abroad derives from the networks that we've built up domestically. We, we're working in global health, obviously, at a time of unprecedented interest in universities and philanthropic organizations. And I hope in the discussion period we can talk about how we optimize and harness that energy for maximum um, impact. I said that what we do in, in capacity building is arguably the most important part of what we do. It's also probably the hardest to sell. Um, I, I was hoping that with my arrival at the Stanford campus that we might give a prize for someone who could make building infrastructure sexy. We, we at, at CDC think that, that having strong laboratory networks, having the workforce in place to do the work is really the guts of making any global health program successful, but this is very difficult to sell to policymakers. The signature program at CDC in, in our area of sustainability is our field epidemiology and laboratory training program. This is our effort to train world-class epidemiologists and laboratorians known in the United States as disease detectives. These people are trained so that they can take leadership positions in developing countries, run global health programs, track epidemics, determine how programs and policies should be set. We often brag at CDC, and you'll see a slide about our engagement in outbreaks all around the world. Really, if we're successful in this program, then CDC will be responding less and people within the host countries in which we work will be responding increasingly. Health security. Um, it, health security is an area where our lives really changed after 9-11. Both domestically and globally, we began taking what's known as an all-hazards approach. Instead of thinking differently about bioterrorist threats, man-made threats, environmental threats, biological threats, disease threats, we began to think in a coherent, holistic way. We began to think about strengthening ministries of health. And, and as, as you'll see in the next slide, we ran into some real challenges. There's a limit to what the United States can do in, in bilateral relationships to assure that information about emerging pathogens, for instance, is widely shared. And there was a growing consensus in the global community that this could only be done on a multilateral basis. Those of you who remember the SARS epidemic may remember that despite the enormous economic toll that it took, despite the enormous rapidity with which it moved around the world and killed people, there were concerns about the speed with which China responded and was transparent. And there have been subsequent concerns, particularly in the pandemic flu area, about the sharing of information and the sharing of samples. So the international health regulations are, are an attempt to create global norms for the sharing of information in the case of emerging pathogens and other threats. This is a map that shows the many continents and many outbreaks in which CDC is involved. And we're very proud of our work, but as I said, ultimately what we're trying to do is build capacity in these countries so that they can respond to emerging threats. Impact is the, th is the third area in which we work at CDC. And this slide, while lacking a picture, is is really compelling. We've all heard about the Lazarus effect. People who, but for the PEPFAR program and the interventions that we've used in, in, 
in treating HIV, particularly in Africa and Asia, would not be alive today. And this slide shows more than 3.2 million life years gained as a result of the support provided by the U.S. government. I've just returned, as I said, from Johannesburg, where this rather stunning slide was presented. For the last several years, there's been growing concern that despite the enormous gains that we've made in dealing with HIV and the lives we've touched and saved, that we haven't made an impact in turning around the epidemic. But, but if you look at the third column, you see substantial reductions in the countries with the highest HIV burden in terms of new cases. You still see in the second column some starting, startlingly high numbers of HIV cases that are um, bringing ruin still to many of these societies, but it's critical uh, that we see these decreases in the, in the final column, and this is good news for HIV. In the United States, States, we've made remarkable progress and virtually eliminated mother-to-child transmission of, of HIV. As you can see, the, the, the epidemic crested in, in around 1993, and we're down to just a handful of cases now. We know what to do, but the story in Africa is somewhat different. Um, only 53% of pregnant women will receive, with HIV, will receive uh, ARVs and the consequences for their children will be dire. We see um, countries that have, like Rwanda that have made enormous progress in this area and other larger countries like Ethiopia and Nigeria where there's enormous work to be done. This is a winnable battle. This is something where we have the tools to make a difference and we just need to bring this to scale and implement it effectively. So to summarize, we work in three domains at CDC. They're related and increasingly engaged in the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief along with uh, the president's malaria initiative and other areas of infectious disease. We work in disease detection, but increasingly, and I'll talk about this in a moment, in non-communicable diseases and injuries. At CDC, we identified five areas where we think we have an opportunity in the next few years to make a substantial impact because we know what to do and we have the tools and they're affordable and implementable and they're polio eradication which we've been at for a long time but we're making substantial progress and again I hope we can turn to that in the discussion period we talked about mother to child transmission of HIV and as well we can make enormous strides in eliminating congenital syphilis globally I want to talk a little bit later about lymphatic filariasis, more commonly known as elephantiasis, where we can make, uh, we can completely eliminate this disease in the Americas. Tobacco control is just waiting to happen, and the same with motor vehicle injury prevention, where we have tools. So let me just set the context. You all know that we're working in difficult budgetary times. The, economic setbacks that we experienced in this country and around the world have made it difficult to sustain support for global health, but we have sustained support. President Obama's been a huge champion continuing the support that President Bush started. And politically, while there are issues in global health that divide Democrats and Republicans, they pale in comparison with the number of issues that bring us together. I want to talk a little bit about global trends and risk and say something about the epidemiology that influences our work in, in global health. You've all seen all of these bullets and you've heard the cliche that germs know no borders. The, I, I, they are cliches, but I think they're also true and they profoundly affect the way that we do global health um, in the 21st century. The world is shrinking and the world is speeding up and that's affecting what we can do for good and for bad. It's often said that the one way of measuring a country's progress in public health is to look at under five mortality. And this slide really uh, tells two stories. One story is um, Africa where 
the story is not good. Under five, mortality is not moving in the right direction. But in the rest of the world, it is. Enormous strides have been made, um, particularly in Asia, in, in developing and emerging economies in Asia. So that's the picture on under five mortality. Um, part of the result of making huge gains in much of the world in under five mortality is that people are living longer and surviving childhood. But a result of that is that we see an increased number of deaths in the 15 to 59 age group and also in people over 60. And we're going to have to address this. This is a fascinating, though slightly dated slide that shows the relationship between health and wealth. We could spend um, an entire couple of hours on this slide. We could spend, um, in fact, many years analyzing the content of this, of this slide. On the horizontal axis is gross national income per capita, and on the vertical axis, under five mortality. In, in descending order. So, and, and we see three groups of countries. On the left, low-income countries, in the middle, middle-income countries, and high-income countries. And there's a, a few ob obvious observations that one needs to make. First, there is a relationship between health and wealth, and it's probably bi-directional. Um, second, there are very interesting policy issues emerging for the U.S. government in this middle area. If you look at countries that are classified as middle income countries, you see China, India soon to be, Indonesia, Mexico, South Africa, Botswana, Kazakhstan, where the United States has major geopolitical interests. Um, a third observation is why is it that some countries, despite their increase in wealth, are underperforming in health. So we look here, for instance, at South Africa, where the, the answer is relatively simple. It's, it's, it's principally HIV. Um, and we look at the other end of the spectrum at a country like Vietnam or Cuba, which are overperforming in terms of their health. Obviously, it's well known that the United States, with a large uh, or bloated investment in global health, is underperforming relative to our wealth and relative to many Western countries. So there are huge policy issues for the United States in how we deal in particular with underperformance and overperformance in both low and middle income countries. And I hope we can return to those questions in the Q&A and discussion. So let's look at factors that affect health in a scheme developed by Tom Frieden, the CDC director. At the bottom of the pyramid are socioeconomic factors like poverty, education, housing, inequality. It's very difficult for us to directly work in this realm at CDC, but we do work very heavily in the next two realms where we have a great opportunity. This realm is changing the, the context, making it possible for people to make healthy choices. You'll notice that a number of the areas described in green really involve policy change. And a major theme of what I want to get across today is that making an impact on health and doing it in a cost-effective way requires substantial policy change. We also work profoundly and deeply at CDC long-lasting protective interventions. These are one or infrequent interventions that at relatively low cost will have a profound and lasting impact on health. Next are important clinical interventions which tend to be expensive and perhaps somewhat less impactful than those below. And finally, counseling and education, an area sometimes of controversy and one that I hope we can return to again in the discussion area. So global health is complex. But in some sense, the questions that we need to answer to know whether we're going to be effective are quite simple. We need to characterize how big a problem is. And classically in epidemiology, we look at who it affects and where. It's often said that if you want to understand an HIV epidemic in a given country, you need to know where your last 
1,000 cases come from. Then we need to look at what interventions are available and whether they're feasible and scalable and how cost effective they are. And then we need to engage in a process of constantly monitoring and evaluating what we do, stopping what doesn't work, improving what's working moderately, and scaling what's working well. Another incredibly boring but vitally important area to talk about is registration data, vital registration. Tom Frieden, our director, has often said that it ought to be considered a basic human right that we record when people are born and when people die. You know, the, the president of Harvard wrote a book about the Civil War and noted that the Civil War was the first time that uh, uh, in America that we began actually recording the deaths of individuals. The, the right to know when a person is born or dies is a fundamental human right. It's also critically important that we have baseline information about disease and about births and deaths. In the Global Health Initiative, the signature um, global health program of the Obama administration, we're attempting to make major, major inroads on things like maternal mortality. And yet it's startling how varied and in some cases poor our baseline information is about how many women die in childbirth. So this is really core to our success in public health. I want to talk about five or six areas where preventive interventions can have an enormous impact on global health. And the, the logical place to start is water and sanitation. Um, you see a map of the world that clusters with darker areas, the, the greater burden of, of diarrheal diseases. Nearly two million kids die, mostly unnecessarily, related to, to, from diarrheal diseases. We, we've seen in, in Haiti with the outbreak of cholera that really basic sanitation, point of use and sanitation system improvements can radically reduce the burden of cholera. And the same thing is true with diarrheal diseases. The, the investments in, in sanitation bear fruit economically. You know, Jeffrey Sachs and Paul Collier and others who've wrote who've written about the relationship between health and wealth would look to an area like this to say, unless people have basic sanitation, basic clean drinking water, it's very difficult for them to earn a living and to be effective and productive workers. HIV. Um, you'll note the contrast between what's in black and what's in red. The six or seven in preventive interventions that are listed here are remarkably cheap both in their administration and in their cost in averting cases. By contrast, when we don't avert a case of HIV, look at what the cost is. Now, $7,000 over a lifetime is a very low number, actually. Those of you who are old enough to remember when ARVs were first introduced will recall that this was less than the annual cost of providing treatment to an individual. So we need to continue to drive that cost down, and we're doing that. But really, we need to work on scaling up these remarkably effective preventive interventions. Four years ago, or slightly more, we learned the benefits of male circumcision. It's as close as we've come to having a vaccine for HIV. We can realize upwards of 60% reductions in acquisition of the HIV infection among men. But remarkably, four years in, we're, we're not seeing the kind of rapid scale up of this intervention that we would like to see. I hope during the question and answer period, we can talk a little bit about why that is and what is an appropriate role for the US government as the principal funder for HIV prevention and treatment in the world in seeing that this intervention is scaled up. Malaria kills up to a million people a year, mostly kids. It's preventable. We see, malaria is in CDC's DNA. We were founded as an organization to control malaria, particularly among US troops.
And we know because much of the southern part of the United States suffered from malaria that we can eliminate it. Um, but we need to use interventions that work. And we need to go to places that are difficult to work in. The, a decision was made uh, in the past year to include Nigeria and the Democratic Republic of Congo in the president's malaria initiative because there's such a high burden of malaria. These are difficult countries to work in, but they have uh, unacceptably high levels of malaria, particularly when we know what to do. And the next slide just shows how effective um, insecticide-treated bed nets are. There are other interventions that this is used in combination with, particularly indoor residual spraying and intermittent treatment. And the CDC's great strengths is in figuring out the right combination of interventions in certain settings. Um, there are certain places in the world, like Zanzibar, in which malaria has been eliminated more than once but it's reemerged, and we need to make sure that, as I said, we monitor and evaluate our efforts, notwithstanding the use of these great interventions to make sure that malaria does not reemerge. Pneumonia takes a terrible toll, notwithstanding the fact that there are four relatively cost-effective and extremely efficacious interventions that we could use. A rather startling uh, thing on this slide is not just the number of kids that die of malaria, but where those deaths are concentrated. Five countries, India, Nigeria, Congo, Nigeria and Congo being President's malaria countries, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Obviously, all of these countries present challenges in terms of where we work, but maybe we can come back later to talking about an effort undertaken by UNICEF to argue that if we work in some of these really difficult places where uh, people at the bottom are suffering terribly, we can make the biggest impact for the smallest investment. TB is an area where tiny investments can prevent enormous costs. This is not a hypothetical. Most of the cases of TB in the United States are imported, and relatively small investments in effective interventions like directly observed therapy can result in dramatic savings. Neglected tropical diseases um, have more attention, particularly um, in the Global Health Initiative announced by the Obama administration in May of 2009. There's really a cluster of 17 diseases, which any of which can be treated very inexpensively. In many, the, the drugs are donated or made available at cost. Um, and these diseases result in terrible, terrible morbidity as well as some mortality. Um, more than a billion people worldwide are affected by these diseases, and there are seven in, in particular that we want to focus on, they have long fancy names, but they cause things like uh, blindness and, and um, swollen limbs and, and, and really bring about socially isolating kinds of morbidity that people simply don't need to suffer from. As I said, we have effective interventions, um, sometimes at remarkably low cost. And we've shown that when we can put these interventions together with educational campaigns, often working with the education sector, we can really make a difference. And, and there's an opportunity to eliminate this disease in the Americas uh, in the next several years. So in infectious disease, we've made great strides, but there's unfinished business in, in polio eradication, obviously in HIV, TB, and malaria, and NTDs. There is still much to be done about uh, emerging pathogens, both bacterial and viral, and in vaccine-preventable diseases where we have vaccines, for instance, for pneumonia and rotavirus, but we don't have the financial commitment to widely disseminate them in the developing world in water and sanitation. So I want to switch now to talking about the burden of, of non-communicable diseases. Um, there actually are more people in the world now overweight than underweight. 
there are higher rates of non-communicable diseases in developing countries than in developed countries. Our investments, the U.S. government's investments in non-communicable diseases in the developing world are very small, notwithstanding the, the fact that they globally kill uh, even more people. By 2020, as you see, non-communicable diseases will kill four times as many people as infectious diseases, and these are not diseases of the rich. Um, it, it, uh, this slide illustrates again that a greater burden, the lower the income of the country for non-communicable diseases. So what to do about it? Well, we have to begin with tobacco. Tobacco is really the agent of death that leads all others. And it's quite startling when you look at these numbers. Again, tobacco kills more people worldwide each year than TB, HIV, and malaria combined. And, and we know that those infectious diseases take a terrible toll. We know what to do about tobacco. The, the World Health Organization has a strategy called Empower with several parts. Um, first, as in all public health problems, we need to have effective monitoring. This is relatively cheap. Um, we need to protect people who don't smoke from people who do. We need to help people who want to quit, quit. We need to affirmatively and aggressively and graphically warn people about the dangers of tobacco. We need to enforce bans on tobacco advertising, promotion, and sponsorship, particularly of things like sporting events. And we need to use an economically proven intervention, which is raising taxes on tobacco. So we know what to do. Most of these interventions are policy interventions, though, and they're difficult. And the next slide illustrates just how difficult they are. We've not brought any of these interventions really to scale globally. Another real area of opportunity, and one familiar to almost anyone who has traveled in the developing world is road traffic safety. The leading cause of death of Americans living and working abroad are traffic uh, accidents. And you can see the burden is enormous with up to 50 million injuries worldwide in places where there simply aren't good trauma and injury care systems and a, a death toll that's unacceptably high. Again, we have proven interventions that can make a dramatic difference. Um, it's often thought, well, is this a, a, another case of uh, a, a public health threat that affects the wealthy nations greater than poor nations? No, just the opposite. 90% of the world's traffic deaths occur in low middle income countries, despite the fact that they have many fewer vehicles per capita. There are great evidence-based interventions for controlling um, this epidemic, and many of them are familiar to you from the United States. Um, limits on drunk driving, increased use of seat belts, increased use of child restraints, helmet use, speed limits. It's, it's, it's a challenging thing to be delivering a lecture at an institution as grand as Stanford and to be talking about things as simple as seat belts. Um, in almost every area in which we work, research is needed, particularly operational research, to think about how we put these policies in place, how we monitor them, how we make sure that they continue to be effective. But these are relatively simple and proven interventions, and we can do it. It's difficult to talk about global health burden without talking about cardiovascular disease, which is, as it is, uh, the leading cause of death. Familiar to you, uh, to those of you who, are, who know the domestic health scene as well. Um, it's quite shocking to many people to look at this second sub-bullet, that this is the leading cause of death in the developing world, with the exception of sub-Saharan Africa, where we have great gains to make in infectious disease. Obviously, the impact on strokes and heart attacks are enormous, and the impact on productivity 
there, there's an eerily familiar uh, tone to this slide um, because so many of the major risk factors for cardiovascular disease are the ones that we experience in the United States. High blood pressure, tobacco, high cholesterol, high body mass index, and, and physical inactivity. These are problems in the developing world. Blood pressure control is doable um, and it's a problem in the developing world and we can control it cheaply and with policy interventions as well. Cancer is another area where it's unlikely we're going to be able to afford costly treatment for cancer prevention, but there, for, cancer, for cancer, but there's so much that we can do to prevent cancer, principally by attacking um, tobacco, use of hepatitis B vaccine for um, preventing liver cancer. There are interesting things happening all over the world in terms of colorectal and cervical cancer screening. I was speaking with a colleague in Johannesburg about an effort by the Rwandan government to vaccinate young girls with the HPV vaccine to prevent cervical cancer. And then there's tried and true and simple things like increasing fruit and vegetable consumption which could substantially reduce cancer deaths. So to summarize, we have an opportunity really to break um, the back of some of these infectious diseases, including HIV, and there's so much to be done in non-communicable diseases um, with tobacco control, sodium reduction, healthier oils. We need to have healthier environments, and we're going to need to rely on regulatory and policy interventions, and I hope in the discussion period we can talk about what the appropriate role of the U.S. government is in the policy arena. Obviously, we're going to need improved clinical care, but it's expensive, and community interventions are always going to be more cost-effective. So millions of people die needlessly from infectious and non-communicable diseases, and we have an opportunity using proven tools to reduce this burden substantially. And that's what excites me about working in global health, and I hope it will bring you into the field as well. Just a few words, finally, about the Global Health Initiative announced by President Obama in May of 2009. It's really an effort to get the U.S. government to work differently internally and externally. We really want to give increasingly increasing responsibility and ownership to the host countries with which we work. And we want to work on sustainability of our programs. We want to stop working in a siloed way on vertical programs and to look for opportunities for integration wherever possible. The President's Global Health Initiative sets extremely ambitious targets for infectious diseases and for family planning and nutrition. But these are achievable. Um, given the interventions that I've described. And we also have set out a number of important principles to guide us. And I would call your attention in particular to the focus on women, girls, and gender equity, which is so important to Secretary Clinton, to country ownership, which I hope we'll have an opportunity to talk about um, what does country ownership mean. Um, sustainability, building capacity to work more effectively with multilaterals, and importantly, metrics, monitoring, and evaluation for everything we do. Finally, the Global Health Initiative recognizes that there are limits to what we can do without substantial investments in research and innovation uh, to look at what works and to fine-tune it.